There are so many people, as you know, the way our culture is, it's always been this way, but it's become so much more so. So many people would give everything they have, they'd sell their soul to the devil to have any section of your career. You know, the first section of your career, the, any, they would take any part of it and they would give everything away. And what is very clear is that you had this really unprecedented uh, success that you managed to keep leveling up to the next level. And you were clearly determined to not become this two-dimensional image to people. You wanted to be who you really are. And of course, in this first part of your career, you know, laughing and some of the early movies, people could say, yeah, she is the giggly girl. She's the giggly blonde. She's the, and they could label you as that. And you were very determined to say, that's not who I am. And I'm going to take some dramatic roles. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to produce, I'm going to do this other stuff. But it felt to me like that is an act of will. That's a very strong act of will to say, no, plenty of people would be very happy with that. Plenty of people would be very happy to be the person who was a huge star and laughing and playing that one role. And so where does that come from? Where does that sense of, of you that says, I'm not going to do that. And in fact, we're gonna do things this way. I think it's part of my nature. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I went to New York at 18 and was left off on 10th Avenue and had no place to stay because the people there actually left for summer. <laughs> And I'm going, wait a minute, I'm, on, I'm in New York, I got a little suitcase and a thing, I was dancing at the World's Fair, so I had a job. I was there, so being a dancer, number one, mm -hmm. uh, since three years old. And you thought of yourself and still think of yourself as a dancer. As a dancer, wow. exactly. Yeah. It's because it's a, it's a lesson in life. And dancing was not only understanding where your body was at every moment, but man, we worked hard. And when we danced, we danced hard. When we worked out, we were going to do a, you know, whatever we could do in order to get better. That was it. Okay. So I had, it was like a, it was like an athlete. All right. Mm -hmm. So you, you build up a, what I say, grit, real grit, because you fall because, you know, and dancers, obviously, aside from training, they were the low end of the totem pole in every every musical everywhere because the singers got this mu thing and the payment and we broke our ass, okay, mm -hmm. no matter what. But, you know, I like that I got the grit. I liked it. So when I went off to New York to do this, I went off, of course, not thinking I'd ever come home again, but I literally did it because I believed I could. Got the audition, go there, can't find a place to live. What do I do? Call home? No. I decided to move in for a little bit with my dance instructor and the choreographer, which was a bad idea because <laughs> I woke up one night with a vibrator, okay? And the vibrator was not in a good spot. Oh. And I literally said, so, Phil, this isn't going to work, so maybe I need to find an apartment. So I found an apartment. My, uh, I left my body. Did anyone else leave their body? I think I left my body and I went into your body. Yeah, and I'm in you. And, and you're I, in my I body. I don't want to be there. No, but you're, you're impressed at my muscle mass. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Sona went into Goldie's body. Yes. Body said, Goldie I'm, said, get out of my body. No, I love it This here. is not a good place. I want to stay there. So, okay, so you wake up vibrator, not in a good place. And you say, I think this isn't going to work. That's right. I mean, I was quite sure it wasn't going to work. Yeah. Okay. There's a certainty that comes when a vibrator is in the wrong area. Anyway, yeah. continue, yes, please. Yes, exactly. Continue and, you know, with decisions... this cross-examination. Yeah, that's a binary decision. <laughs> <laughs> decisions get made very yeah. quickly that yeah. way. Okay. Now, I so I, I went out and I got an apartment, right? Now, I'm, I'm just saying this only because... You don't go home again. You fight for what you believe in. It is nobody going to take care of you. You're going to take care of yourself, which I was fine. So I went to basically 70, 70th Street, and I found a one-room apartment, a lot of roaches, seven police ro lo you know, locks that was mm -hmm. on the door, and um, a guy below, a man, I would say, was a junk dealer. 
So he he had like people lying in the hallway having mm-hmm. been shot up. Now I'm from a dead end street in, in Maryland, right? And I thought I went and got the police. And the police, which I said, because I saw him come over and he looked at her. I pulled him. I said, this isn't good. Now, I just moved in the apartment. I'm already telling the police what to do. Right. And the police said, (laughs) come on, Deirdre, let's go. Come on, Deirdre. And she was one that had just, you know, gotten a fix somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And and then I was scared of Deirdre because Deirdre was like in that, you know, doing that. And then one day I walked out because I was much more afraid in my building than I was outside. I mean, it was like that. And I was walking up the street and sure enough, she's following me. Oh, man. Oh, my God. So when now she's following me, now I'm freaked out. Right. Remember, I'm 19 now. And I go into some coffee shop and I sit down and I talk to the guy next to me. And I said, no, see that girl? She's got her nose against the thing and she's looking after me and I'm scared of her. He said, listen, why don't you come to my office? I'm a chiropractor. And you can sit there for a while and feel comfortable. So I said, okay, that would be great. So he pulls his car around and I go to New Jersey to his chiropractor. Wait a minute. I, I, this doesn't sound on the level. What? I've many times said to women, I'm a chiropractor, come with me. And I have no license. And it's, ladies, don't listen. So did you, did it, was it okay? After I was sitting in his waiting room for like an hour, I said, you know, I have to get back to the city. I mean, I can't stay here, you know. And then eventually it was like he drove me back to the city. I said, gee, thanks. That was really great. All I asked for was a little comfort, you know, from this guy. Yeah. But I thought that I could take solace in his apartment, in his, uh, his whatever, his office for a while. No, no, no. No, I drove over the George Washington Bridge. I mean, it, it was like I was being kidnapped. Oh, my God. I, I, tr- I, mean, I mean, I trusted everybody. Yeah, because, that's you know, a bad I, story. I mean. No, uh... no I, I have a worse story. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have a worse story. So when I came to New York in in May, I got this roach infested apartment, and I then uh, went to a bathing suit tryout. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had a bag. My bag was fr- bigger than me, and I had my bathing suits in there. And I met this guy running, going to go on the subway. And I met this guy who was a very seemed to be a very nice guy. Uh, he said, you know. I'm ju- I got to stop you for a minute. I've got to stop you. Um, I, I, you look, you're not going to believe me. I'm not putting the make on you or anything. He said, look, I've got to watch here. I go with Tuesday Weld, who happened to be at that time in the 60s, like a big deal. And it says, I love you Tuesday on it. And I went, oh, I said, oh, OK. He said, but here's the deal. <clears throat> Al Cap. Now, I'm standing on a corner. Mm-hmm. Al Cap just created a television series out of Lil Abner. It's going on to t- t- TV, NBC. But you look like just amazing character that he created called Tenderleaf Erickson. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, you have an interesting face. And I thought, I do. I do have an interesting face. I don't call it a beautiful face, but, you know, big eyes. And so I, I thought I probably look a little strange, but he didn't say to me, you look great. You're gorgeous. No, I have an interesting face. So I believed him. Then he said to me, look. I want to give you a script. I want you to take a look at this. And if you need a ride, because I've stopped you, I've got a car. Oh. I'll drop you off at the, you know, wherever you are, you know, to the audition, which was, I don't know, Madison and something. And and I just been in New York. So this is not even a month. And my job is basically, you know, in Flushing because I was at the World's Fair. So mm-hmm. I was doing Can Can on top of a bar at the Texas Pavilion. So anyway... Now I sort of, uh, you know, he called me a little bit and warmed me up. And, you know, it was like, hmm, oh, you know, it's cute. He gives me a script. And then I said, this is awesome. And he said, I want you to talk to Al Cap. He's getting an award, like Man of the Year Award in Kansas City or some university. And I talked to him. And he sounded very nice. I'm really looking forward to meeting you. <clears throat> and I called mom and dad. And I went, this is so great. I mean, you know, I, 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 this will be great. I'm nervous about it, but now time comes. And I get into a cab and I go over to Fifth Avenue, uh, an apartment. <laughs> like, I'm going, oh, my God, from Roach City all the way up to the Fifth Avenue apartment. And I went in. They're expecting me. 
I get in the elevator and then the butler comes out and he says, oh, Goldie, we've been waiting for you. Wonderful welcome. And I sit down in his lovely apartment and he said, Mr. Cap is not here yet. He said, but um, he likes his women to pour his tea. Okay. <laughs> that was a moment. Then he brings out a 400 pound sterling silver tea set with tea in it. And now I'm sitting there looking at the teapot and wondering if I even had the fulcrum to be able to lift the teapot <laughs> to know how to pour it into the cup. I had to do this with my elbow, you know, because I mean, yeah. come on. Then he comes in, Goldie. <laughs> How lovely to see you. I'll be right back. Goes into his room. He comes back in a dressing gown. He limped a little. Hmm. So then he goes, he sits down. We have a conversation. I then started getting worried about his ladies pouring his tea. So I explained to him that I just got here from New York and I've been dancing and I've got a really good family and I wanted him to think well of me so he, I wasn't one of those girls. And I told him, that you know, my mom, you know, she, daddy was really interested in me working. You see, he was such support. But, um, you know, my mom really wanted me to end up marrying a Jewish dentist. And that's kind of the way it worked, right? And so... Uh, that was great. And he said, well, okay. So now I'm reading for him. He was very legit. He said, look, you're projecting too much. So remember, there's microphones. And now I'm reading this part. That I don't remember who she was. And then he said, now I'd like you to go over to the, the end of the room. And I want you just just make me the camera so I can get an idea. And just, you know, look a little stupid. I mean, look, look, look kind of, you know, like you're just, um, uh, just, you know, and like an imbecile. So now I'm trying to, you know, work on this and going, okay, I have to look like an imbecile. So I'm going to take the beads and put it out of my mouth. I had like pop beads on the 60. Mm -hmm. And I put them in my mouth and I walked toward him and looked just stupid. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just trying to look like, what is that little thing? Girl? And, and now I'm looking at him. And now he said to me, now, you know what? You could play Daisy May. Now, I did little Abner in school. I know that play backwards and forwards, all the music. No, I was not Daisy May. She's very buxom, mm -hmm. you know, shorts, you know, really sexy, you know, one of those. And so I thought, I'm, this isn't, this is weird. So he said, I'd like you to, put, I'd like to see your legs. Oh my God. So I went over by the smoky mirror. And now keep in mind, <clears throat> dancers are not shy. I mean, we, we dance with, you know, things on and whatever. So when you're dancing and you're doing go-go, which I did, I danced on tables too, is that you shake it, you do it, you, you know, you've got, and you have like high cut leotards and you, you know, you change in the thing and the, and the wings, you know, you, you're fine. You've got your underpants on, you're covered, whatever. So I wasn't shy, but I was dubious. And so now I remember, I know exactly what I was wearing. It's amazing when you have these moments. It was a pink knit, maybe mini, beginning mini, not much, just over the top of the knees. And now I pull my skirt up just a little bit. He said, more. So I pulled it up another inch. And he said, higher. And I said, no, that's it. I'm done. He said, okay. He said, Goldie, come on over here. So I go over. He has now taken out his penis. It was, I mean, I'm telling you, it was not a pretty picture. I mean, I love penises, but I mean, this was not a good one. <laughs> and he, he, and it was flipped over this, his situation. It's basically was a wooden leg. So he limped. And the reason is, is that, you know, he had a wooden leg. He didn't bless his heart. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a thing. But he did have another leg. And that leg, he said, now come over here and give me a little kiss. And I looked at him. I looked at his limb, other limb. I looked at his wooden leg. I came back and I said, Mr. Cat, I will never get a job like this. Wow. I will never do that. He said, oh, well, I've had them all. You're going to go nowhere in this business. I've had them all. You name it. He said, so it's done. And I said, okay. And I was upset 
because, but I was getting it on the way, you know, so I got, you know, and then I said, <clears throat> okay, I said, I better get going because I'm going to be late for my work at the World's Fair. And he threw $20 at me and he said, take a cab. And I went out there and I went there. I did all my show. That was a huge show we did. It wasn't just a can-can. It was uh, 40 minutes of dancing straight. I mean, truly hard. And I'm sh trying to shake the fringe. It's black fringe. I'm trying to do all this stuff. And I was like bereaved. The fellow that I had been seeing a bit was down below. Basically, he was the bartender. He caught and he said, listen, let's, let's, let me take you out for a drink. Now, I said, okay, so we went back to, to the Andive, which was just by the 59th Street Bridge, and it was a, basically a bar. And I sat there at the bar, and one of his friends came up. <clears throat> his friend had a car. And it was about 2.30 in the morning, and we was driving us home. And we go on West Side Highway, and this is all in one day. We were pushed over by a taxi cab, into a light pole. At that time, the West Side Highway was horrible. And we crashed. I saw it coming. I went underneath the dashboard. It was a no bucket seats in those days, no seat belts. I was in the middle. The two guys were on either side of me. We hit this light pole. I was knocked out. I, I remember that there was somebody pulling at me and asking, to, is she alive? And they cut everything to try to get to me. The boys, I don't know what was happening to the boys. They took me to the hospital, the ambulance, I guess. I don't remember any of it. And I woke up with a nurse trying to get x-rays. And, you know, I vomited all over her. And she was so mean, by the way. She said, you know, you just had the dry heaves, you know. And then, of course, I didn't. And now my, my friend came in. He had a gash on his nose. The other fellow that was driving had a gash in his knee. I had a gat little gash in my leg and a concussion. Only God could have saved us from that. Only God. And as it turned out, <clears throat> to end this particular story, I, call, I, I woke up in my apartment that I do not remember going into. I woke up to the phone ringing, and it happened to be this fella. He the said, "The one who connected you, yes, to, to the young guy. yeah, yeah, Peter." Yeah. So Peter said, "You fucked everything up, didn't you? I told you to be nice to him. I told you to do this, and you uh. fucked everything up." And I said, "Peter, go back to Tuesday Weld and leave me alone." Jesus. I then made it to the bathroom. I was so dizzy. I. I threw up again, and then I realized I had nobody in New York. I didn't have, the only number I had, the new number I had was his. So I picked up the phone, and by the grace of God, I remembered that number. And I called him back up, and I said, Peter, I'm sorry, but I was in a really bad accident last night, and I'm alone, and he was just horrified. He hung up came to my house, he lived right down the street to my apartment, and he had roses, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, I'm just a pimp for Al Cap, and you're such a nice person. Oh, he took me to the hospital. He again. pretty much, he admitted it? He had yes. Said, wow. Whoa. Yes, and, and he was 26 years old, and I was 19. So he was a kid. After that, my mom came for two weeks, and then until I started, you know, feeling better, I'm going to jump to something really crazy right now because it'll end the story, truly end the story. When I go places, I like to see holy places. Mm -hmm. I like to see people who might have a gift of the future. I'm, I'm interested in all the things like you said. And so I was now with Kurt. We had made protocol. Kurt had made another movie. We decided to go to Nepal, do some hiking, came back went to Thailand, and now we're in Thailand. And I said to someone that we had met there from, he's, I would love to find um, someone, a psychic, or something, so we went to the, you know, all the beautiful places, but we went and met this guy. His name was Sonny, young man. He sat down at a Thai restaurant where we met him, and he's looking at me, looking at all the things he starts writing. They were all geometrics. And he looked at me and he said, 
did you almost die when you were around 19? And I said, no, no, I, I, I didn't. He said, it's written. You, you just think back. And then I remembered my accident. And I remembered that I le like left my body and saw, oh, I got the chills, and saw myself being pulled out and all of that. And I thought, I wonder if that was meant to happen. And then I went back to my body. Because I then said to him, I said, no, actually, I was in a really bad accident. Ah, he said, because it says that your life changed very quickly after that. And I did. I went to L.A. I, got, I had a job in L.A. I cut my hair. I went to a thing. I danced in Vegas. Next thing I come back, I'm excited. I, I got a job dancing on the Andy Griffith and show and thing. And I was like home free. And it was amazing. And I was going to be used. Nick Castle was a choreographer. I'm going to use you in everything. And so an agent comes up to me on the show, services the shows. And I was just with 12 beautiful girls. And he asked me, do you have an agent? And I said, I don't really. And he said, I'd like to talk to you. And of course, do I trust men at that point? Not really. So I figured it was just that guy. It was like, I'm not really, I'm going to the William Morris office. You got to be kidding. He, they called, are you coming? We're expecting you, whatever. This is after the show is over. And I said, oh, I, I the, oh, you, you mean this is real? You mean he really does want to see me? And, 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 well, you get over here, you know, uh, we're at William Morris, we're all waiting for you. And so I, I get in my car, which, by the way, the car was like 54 forward, and every time I made a right-hand turn, the left-hand door opened. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I it's had, kind of a signal. <laughs> it works like a signal. I mean, I, I used to, you know, just one hand make a right-hand turn. I couldn't do left hands or that, you know. I get up there, I go to William Morris, they're all sitting there and all the agents are sitting there and they're just adorable. They're all, you know, uh, they all have Jaguars is all I can say. They all had Jaguars. And they were sitting there and then my this young agent said, I have a feeling about her. Cut to. They said, well, if you sign her, you know, go ahead and sign her if you believe in her, you know. And I don't have, I don't say a word. So now, next thing I know, you put me up for this thing. Oh, she's too young for that. She, she shouldn't be in that. He said, I just want them to see her. Now, this was, you know, Persky and Danoff. These are all, you know, big people, big, funny mm -hmm. people. And this was a three-camera three show. I go in there. I do the audition. I come out. I go home. My agent called, my new agent, and he said, you got the part. Is this Good Morning World? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a brother, Neil, and my listeners are probably familiar with Neil, and he knows everything, everything about television, especially 60s, 70s, everything. And he's always bringing up the thing that you don't expect him to say. And so I say, I'm really excited because I'm going to talk to Goldie Hawn tomorrow. And he went, oh my God, because he loves you. And he's like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. And there's 75 things that are huge hits that people associate with Goldie Hawn. And he says, ask her about Good Morning World. <laughs> oh my God. With Ronnie Shell. Oh my God. And I'm like, what? And he went, yes. Oh my God, Good Morning World. I have all nine episodes. And, and I said, you know what? I might. And then I'm thinking, no, I'm not. And then you bring me, like oh, you say, there's a magic in the world. Exactly. So I, I know uh, about the sitcom you got that was before you got laughing. Exactly. Which turned you, like, which blew up crazily. I yeah. mean, really, that is so insane. But the fact that my brother, Neil, he's always doing that. If I said, oh, I'm going to go see Jane Fonda, he'll say, well, ask her about you know, the time that she was on Have Gun, Will Travel as a 13-year-old opposite Burt Mustin. And I'll be like, what? Oh, yeah, no, 1959. She was great. She said, help, help, get the sheriff. <laughs> that, I'm like, what? That well, how so about funny. all the other shit Jane Fonda did? Oh, yeah, okay, you can ask her about that. But anyway, that's that so cool that you brought that so up. Nobody knows about that. Uh, Neil does. I mean, now, 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 one person. God knows. bless you, Neil. Yeah. Oh my God. But, I um, mean, but you know, every, I am a everything you're talking about. I mean, uh, first of all, you know, we live in this new reality now. Thank God. I hope where 
everything that happened to you is crazily actionable. It's it's uh, we we'd like to think that that's over, but the fact that that was just a part of the life of 19 year old attractive blonde who comes from a really good family and is just trying to make it and that's that's yeah that happens oh yeah well what ha you know that's just part of it is absolutely uh, insane and 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 kind of devastating that that was just a regular part of the world oh definitely i mean it was like my mother wrote me a letter <clears throat> and she said I'm very happy, sweetheart. But remember, only you can make people care about you. Your producers don't matter. And there's this little thing called the casting couch. Mm -hmm. And she said, just be aware of that. Because the one person that has to make it is you. You have to be prepared. You have to be good enough to know that you will be the one that the audience will applaud. It's not about your producer. So we, I had a work ethic. Yeah. I also, a year later, just as a coda to this story, a guy stops me on 8th Avenue as I'm going down to a, another audition. He stops me. His name is Jeff Tuffler. And he said, stop. Listen, I got I to gotta tell you something. You look like just... You look like a character that Al Cap just created, and I want to talk to you about oh, it. Oh, no. Oh, boy. And I yelled at him. And I said, don't come to me with that. I know exactly who you are. I was, I was taken by another pimp just like you. I said, so I'm not, I'm not interested. And he said, can I buy you a hamburger? And I said, yes, because I didn't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> you always say yes to a hamburger. I mean, please, yeah. when do you turn yeah. that down? Yeah. So while I was eating the hamburger, I said, I just want to say one thing to you. I live at 888th Avenue, and you put a contract in my mailbox because I'm not doing this. I then go to audition to be a Copa girl, and there he is. And I went over to him, and I said, I'm telling every girl here who you are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like when we have ethics, you know, those are ethics. Those yes. are yeah. stand up and be counted. Yeah. And I was fearless about what I believe to be ethical and true. And, and I guess at the end of the day, it's who we are. Yeah. It's who we are. 